Um, so I'm going to talk about software. Um, so we are, of course, here to celebrate the 70th anniversary of the Cyrac computer. And as we've seen today, when people talk about that computer, they often show images of what those old computers look like. And therefore, the focus is always on the hardware. And I'm going to make the case for you today that that's not the important bit. The important bit is actually the software that runs on the hardware. In fact, none of you would be in this room today, none of you would be able to come to this event today, was it not for software. You, you've all used software getting here, whether you, know, you use Google Maps or you use an Uber or you used your Mikey card. You all, used, you all used software, so you have a lot to thank for software. And, I, and I'll just quote to you um, a couple of nice quotes about software. I'm actually taking this from um, Museums Victoria website, um, which holds the collection of the Cyrac software library. So that's the original software that ran on that computer. Um, it's actually the, the arguably the oldest software library in the world. And on Museums Victoria's uh, website, they quote that um, software is the blood that gives life to a computer, which is a pretty nice quote. Um, there's another nice quote that I like, which is actually a much more recent quote. It's by Grady Booch, who's one of the more modern pioneers of software. And he says, software is the invisible thread and hardware is the loom on which we weave the fabric of computing, which I think is also another beautiful um, quote. Now, of course, software 70 years ago looked quite different than it is today. In fact, that word invisible is important because the reason that people show images of the old Cyrac computer as pieces of hardware is because you can't see software. Well, you can't see it now, but back in the day, you could. And again, I'll quote from um, Museum's Victoria website, which describes this software library. And it says, the software library for Cyrac comprises punched paper tapes, inboxes, placed in order within a set of purpose-built pigeonholes. So it was a physical thing in those days. It's no longer a physical thing. So I want to talk about software, and in particular, I want to talk about software engineering, which is really just the discipline of how do we engineer reliable software at scale, which, of course, we need to do all over the place right now. And just a little bit of history on that. Um, so the term software engineering um, is not quite 70 years old. Um, there was actually a, a kind of milestone anniversary recently in 1968. 1968 was the, the, the year that the term software engineering was coined. So we've just had the 50 year anniversary of that. And it was coined in Germany at a, at a NATO conference um, at a place called Garmisch. And this is one of the original photos of all the people who were at that Garmisch conference. And they essentially got together to, because they realized that software was getting larger. It was no longer just boxes of tapes, um, but it was a very significant large thing, and that we needed an engineering discipline to actually do that at scale. You will notice um, that, thankfully, the gender diversity of software engineering has changed somewhat since those early days. We still have a long way to go, but it's, um, it's at least a lot better than it was in those days. But I want, to, I want to argue today that we're actually at a nexus in the, in the history of software engineering. So if you look at those 50 years of software engineering, we've developed lots of different methods for building software at scale, lots of different tools to support software developers, lots of different techniques. And I think it's fair to say that, in general, we've done a pretty good job of being able to build you know, large-scale software that you know, more or less does what we want it to do, that more or less at a cost that we can afford, more or less that it's secure, it's safe, and you know, even nowadays kind of takes care of things like data privacy. Of course, there's been problems along the way, but more or less we have a pretty good understanding of how to build these very large scale uh, software systems. In fact, we saw some of them in the last talk at scale. But where I think we are lacking is in putting into software what, I, what I'm calling human values. So we are human beings, we live in a society, 
and we value certain things. You know, and if I was to ask any of you today what you value, you probably wouldn't say functionality costs and things like that. You would say things like, you know, where we want an inclusive and diverse society. You know, so the question to ask is, you know, given 50 years of software engineering, do we know how to build software or do we do we, do we build software that does it in an inclusive way and that um, creates a more diverse society? And I'd argue that we don't. Um, yes, there has been some work on you know, accessibility um, in, in software systems and, and software for the visually impaired and things like that. That's an example of inclusion. But we don't even think about inclusion when we build software. We don't think about including all the diverse um, kinds of people that live on the planet and building software for all of them. We typically think of building software for the middle classes because they can afford to buy it, right? Um, diversity is another one. I've already uh, hinted at how it was in, in 1968, but even today it's not that much better. So 80% of professors in, uh, well, of AI professors in computer science departments around the world nowadays are men, even today, that's at 80%. And then you can talk about other, other values, you know. Do we know or do we build software that is transparent? You know, do we know what it does? Could we explain what it does? Do we, do we think about integrity? You know, we, you know, again, we want, to, we want to have integrity as individuals and as a society and as governments and as institutions. But do we build software that has that same kind of integrity or that can support integrity in those individuals or in those institutions? Um, or even things like compassion. You know, do we think about compassion when we build software? Do we think, do you think that software developers, when they're building software, are thinking, I need to make this compassionate. That might sound odd at first, why should they? But they should. Imagine if you're building software for a hospital system that's going to take over the role of a nurse or take over the role of a doctor. You'd want it to be compassionate, wouldn't you? But we don't have methods to build compassionate software. We don't have methods to build software that promotes self-respect. Or even, even values like, um, you know, um, changing power dynamics or or respecting traditions, or even things like family. We don't think about these things when we build software. And I'm arguing today that we need to think about these human values when we develop software. Why? Why do we need to think about these things? And why do we need to think about these things now, in particular? Well, the reason is because we're at a very interesting time in the history of software. Um, with the emergence of machine learning and artificial intelligence, um, these kinds of human issues are becoming much more important. And I'll just give you some examples. So uh, some of you might have heard of the Compass system. The Compass system is a, um, a computer system that is already in use in American law courts, um, and it's used at parole boards to help um, parole board judges decide which criminals are likely to reoffend, And partially based on the information from that computer system, decisions are made about which criminal, criminals to release back into society and which not to grant parole to. Sounds good. Um, collect some data, churn some systems, make some parole board decisions. The problem is that there's a very famous study of that system that showed that it's biased. It's racially discriminatory. It, is, it was twice as likely to flag black defendants as reoffenders as it was white offenders. So we're not thinking about racial discrimination when we build software, and we are building software that is racially biased. Another example, um, this is actually China. Um, uh, there, there are schools now in China that use facial recognition systems in classrooms. Um, so there was a trial where they had um, cameras in classrooms looking at the children's faces and then applying AI algorithms to automatically detect what the emotions of those children were. And the, you know, it was being used as a way to essentially monitor the children, you know, and, and make sure they were paying attention and things like that. Just in case you think this is only happening in China, I actually learned just yesterday that there are now Australian schools that are using facial detection algorithms in schools, not to monitor in the actual classroom, 
um, but as a you know as a as a as a, a way to as kind of a, a facial detection path to actually get into the school. So you know all kinds of you know uses are going on around the world with facial detection algorithms. Um, we're not necessarily thinking about the values that we want when we're putting those systems in. Although some places are, so San Francisco, for example, has actually um, banned facial detection algorithm use by any government agency. And this is a nice example. So if I was to ask you, um, what is the cost of an airline ticket from Miami to Houston? What would you say? You'd probably say $300. $400, $500. And normally, you would be right. Unless there happened to be a hurricane heading for Florida. In which case, the cost of an airline ticket from Miami to Houston is about $3,000. Why? Well, because these airline ticketing systems work on supply and demand algorithms. And if the government puts out a warning, a mandatory evacuation warning, People need to get out, they need to buy tickets, they go on the website, and suddenly the price shoots up from $300 to $300. Now, this was a phenomenon, this ha actually happened with Hurricane Irma, um, and this was a phenomenon that was described by the New York Times at the time, the problem being that there are no ethical valves built into our software systems. So that software was designed without thinking of the, you know, about you know, helping people out when they're in a, in a national emergency and things like that. And, and this is a bit of a tragic um, example, I'm afraid. Um, so this is Molly Russell. Molly Russell was a British teenager. Um, and in 2017, she tragically committed suicide. Now, her parents um, have essentially blamed that suicide on Instagram. Why? Because um, Molly was unfortunately one of these teenagers who was into self-harm. And she um, used Instagram to look at images of other people committing self-harm. Now, Instagram, like many social media systems, has recommendation algorithms in it that serve up content for you to look at. And the way that they work is that if you start looking at self images of self-harm, you will be given more images of self-harm until the point where your feed it's filled with nothing but images of children committing self-harm. And the, their parents have argued um, very convincingly that that recommendation algorithm partially led to Molly Simpson committing suicide. They've, they've, they, 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 and the real problem is that they then um, went public with this. Um, Instagram initially said it was just going to put kind of flags on images of self-harm. It then said it was going to actually ban all images of self-harm. Um, the CEO of Instagram was interviewed on BBC Radio um, about a week or two ago. After two years, they still haven't been able to come up with an algorithm that can completely automatically remove all these images of self-harm. So they're still up there, even after two years. So again, we're not designing software in a way that respects human values. Um, but it's not just about AI, actually. It's about much more mundane software as well. And this is actually an example that happened to me. Um, anybody who shops online at Woolworths, it's a great thing. It uses software. Um, one thing that will so sometimes happen with Woolworths online shopping is that the product that you ordered is not available, and you will be given a substitution product. Now, in this particular case, I ordered a box of 10 large free-range eco eggs and then I received this email a couple of hours before my um, shipment was due that the eco eggs were unfortunately out of stock and had been replaced with 10 large um, jumbo caged eggs. Um, now, that's an example that doesn't match my values. I ordered those free range eco eggs for a particular reason because um, of uh, you know, environmental sustainability and, and, all, and all of that, in particular human value. But of course, the system had no knowledge of that, um, it hadn't been designed with those human values in mind. So where does this leave us? So my, what, what, what I'm saying is that even though we've had 50 years of coming up with methods to build, design software at scale, we don't currently have any systematic methods for taking into account these human values when we build software. And we should, because software is 
everywhere in society. And if we're not careful and we let this run wild, we're going to end up with a society that doesn't respect the values that we want. So we are trying to fix this um, at Monash University, and I won't speak very long about this, but I will just briefly mention some of the stuff we're doing. Um, we've got research going to actually reinvent the way that we develop software and come up with new methods that, that take into account human values from the beginning. The first question that people usually ask is, well, what is a value anyway? You know, you can't do this because values are too vague. Nobody knows what they are. Well, of course, it turns out that in social sciences and psychology, they have studied human values for decades. So we're using a model, um, Schwartz's model, a theory of universal human values, that we want to kind of um, put into software. Um, and essentially what, what Schwartz did, he was a psychologist that went across the world and he had a, an instrument, a, a survey instrument that he invented to collect values from people. He did it in 82 different countries and he came up with this model that had 10 high-level, universally agreed values. Now, that doesn't mean that we all have the same values, or we all have the same values at any given time. What it means that everything on that slide, we would, we would look at and think, yeah, that's a value. You know? And then when we're building software as a corporation, maybe we, we've got corporate values, which is a subset of those. And what we're doing at Monash is to make sure that when we're giving software methods so you can actually build software that pr primarily takes into account the subset of the values that, that you're interested in. So, so this is not about ethics, um, by the way, because we're not trying to impose a moral standard here. We're allowing you to choose your own values and put your own values into the software you're building, um, which is very different from ethics, which is about kind of societally agreed norms. So we have a research group doing this at Monash. It's called Ovis. There's a website there if you want to learn more. Um, but some of the kind of things that we're doing, we're working a lot with industry, so we've actually gone into industry, in, into companies, and we've studied how they think about values now. And, and the good news is that they do actually think about values. You know, corporate values are um, uh, very prominent in industry. Um, ever since a book by Jim Collins that did an analysis of successful companies and said successful companies are the ones that have strong corporate value cultures. Ever since then, everybody has corporate values. So 85 out of 100 FTSE 100 companies have prominent corporate values on their websites. And some of those companies actually do take them quite seriously. They don't yet take them seriously when they're building or procuring software. It tends to be more at an organizational culture level. So we're working a lot with companies to, to understand how they do it and help them improve that. In fact, we've got um, projects going on right now looking at agile software development methodologies and trying to find places within those agile software development methodologies where you can have conversations about values and design systems in a different way to respect values. And then we've got projects going on that are much more kind of applied. So we've got a project going on in Bangladesh with female rural farmers and there's an organization trying to introduce um, mobile computing and apps and so forth into Bangladesh, but not necessarily aligned with the values of those local farmers. So we're doing studies about what are the what are the values of those local farmers? What are the values of the computing software that's being introduced? Do they match? If they don't, let's design it in a different way. Um, and then lots of other stuff that we're doing as well. But I won't go into that right now. Um, but I should probably finish. You know.